They call emergency now. I want to see emergency. Oh, you need emergency. Mama, I'm sorry. Mama, I'm sorry. Mama, I'm sorry. Okay, ma'am, are you with him right now? He's not breathing at all. We all are with him. Oh, please, somebody, he's dead. It's the AEMT Lecture Series. Welcome, my name's Mike Morris, and today we are covering our first chapter, chapter number one. Whew. We're going to try to get through this it's exciting material, let me tell you. But it's important material. And we'll try to put a spin on it to make it a little more interesting to you, I hope. Um, uh, just like a little warning in advance, equipment's new. At least, um, well, it's not new, but it's new to me. And so I'm learning as I go. Hopefully, um, you know... By chapter 20, I'll be ready to roll with it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, you should be able to find all of this if you found this video lecture. I'm sure you found your PowerPoint, and we can go through it and cover some topics. Discussion. All right, National EMS Standard Competencies. And which is interesting if you national EMS education standard competencies. It doesn't say the state of Georgia education standard competencies competencies. Does not say Cap County, it says national. So what well, first thing we need to understand is that there is a national component, there's a or aka a federal component, there's a state component. And there's a local component and speaking of all of this so and we're going to talk about licensure we're going to talk about certification and so when you talk about national registry EMT they test and I hope you can't hear the the weed eater right outside the window here but I'll try to edit it out if I hear it but um, yeah they test uh, in our EMT they write their tests, they do everything based on that national uh, curriculum. And so I went to a NR EMT test uh, meeting, and I want to show you that video. So hang on one second, let me see if I can get it up. All right, guys, uh, we got to make up the NREMT test. So uh, let's brainstorm a little bit. I think uh, each question should have four right answers, and then we make them pick the most right. Ooh, I like that, I like that. Like, your patient's unconscious. Do you A, check the airway, B, check for breathing, C, check airway and breathing, D, all the above? Yep, yeah, I like that. I like that right there, yeah. Oh, dude, I got one, I got one, okay. You arrive on scene, your patient is completely covered in honey and being stung by bees. Yeah. Uh, do you A, spray them with the hose and hope they're not Africanized honey bees? Mm -hmm. B, cover yourself in honey and take one for the team? I like it. C, call medical direction for instructions on how to use an EpiPen? Mm -hmm. Or D, check their airway? I mean, the obvious answer is airway. <laughs> All right, guys, I feel like that was a pretty successful test. That should yield us a 90 to 95% failure rate, which is a success in my mind. God, we are so good. Pretty good, huh? Ha, ha, ha. Yep. Well, <laughs> if we follow the National EMS Education Standards and the curriculum, hopefully... We won't have a 90% failure rate. I've never had a 90% failure rate. Oh, that'd be a bad day. So anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so we're going to talk about all of these things and um, see where that takes us. Okay, so emergency medical services, EMS systems. So we have an EMS system, right? And it's like a team. And we'll talk about that team. History of EMS, we're not going to talk about it. You, you've already had it. You can read about it. You should be fine. 
uh, roles and responsibilities. We've already talked about it. You can read about it. You're going to be okay. Uh, quality improvement, patient safety, research. So yeah, that's an important part of this that we might not have talked about that much. We'll talk about it a little bit today. And public health. You can read about it. All right. <clears throat> so EMS is a system. And it truly is a system. And like I said, that system has players on it that we don't always see. Like from the federal level, the state level, right? We don't always see everybody even on the local level. Um, and that's, you know, unfortunate some uh, that on the local level, but you'll probably, hopefully we'll get better at that. Like seeing our medical director, we just hired a new one. So, um, Hopefully, uh, Dr. Carr will be accessible. Okay. Um, so, uh, provide pre-hospital and hospital emergency care. That's what we do. Uh, that local or regional EMS system. So, our local system <clears throat> involves us it involves our medical director and that's kind of where it stops then at up just above the local level we're governed by the state level that's where like the state office of EMS picks up okay now we're going to talk about the different parts of this and kind of what everybody does we since we're providers of this emergency care first we have to be certified and who do you think certifies us that would be the national registry of emts they certify us they are the cert certifying agency that the state of georgia said you know what we feel like that they're the ones to do the certification and once you pass your NREMT exam and your practical, you will be a certified AEMT. You won't have a license yet, not until you apply. And after you apply, the state of Georgia will issue you a, a license. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. All right, for training licensures levels, <clears throat> um, you should know these. Uh, EMR, EMT, AMT paramedic. There is one called cardiac technician that you don't have to worry about. It's being phased out. And I think there's like 15 of those folks left. Um, EMR, we don't recognize in the state of Georgia. It wasn't too long ago that we didn't recognize EMT. We, we did, uh, but not where it is now. We recognized EMT as basically the what currently serves as the AEMT. Um, all basic EMTs could start IVs. Well, they changed that now, and so that's and that that stuff changes. I mean, it, it changes from state to state. Um, a long time ago, I went to Gulfport, Mississippi. I think it was Hurricane George that was down there, and they teamed me up with somebody who worked for Gulfport uh, EMS. And so I was the paramedic and the person they teamed me up with, of course, was the EMT. And so we're in Mississippi and um, I'm down there running, running calls. And this, like, one of our first calls, um, I asked the EMT, like, hey man, do you wanna start an IV for me? And he was like, um, no man, I can't do IVs. And I'm like, look, I get it. You know, you have some difficulty, trouble. I'm not, I don't care if you miss the first time. Restick, you know, whatever. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. I can't do IVs. They don't let us here. And I was like, what? But yeah, yeah, I wasn't familiar with the standard of care and how it changed from state to state at the time. But it does. And it can. It can change from state to state. All right, this talks about the EMRs and EMTs, the differences, AEMT, paramedic. 
training and licensure requirements vary by state. And that's just what I was talking about. Um, the NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety, Safety Administration, is the federal administrative source for this curriculum and related documents. And that's the curriculum that we're going to try to stick with. Same subjects that you discussed in EMT. It's the same thing we're discussing here, except we're going to talk about more procedures uh, that you can do. But scene size up, patient assessment, the treatment, how you're going to package them, how you're going to get them to the hospital. Same type setup here. There are license. There are state licensure requirements. Okay, um, you had to do a background. You everything you did to become a Georgia State EMT will do. Um, I think we. I don't know. I think we have to do it over again. But we'll have a lot of that on file. Um, but yeah, you got to have a high school diploma or GED. You know, so you could actually become certified and not get a license. Yeah, it could happen. Background check, drug screen, all of these. You have to have some type of psychological, demonstrate the ability to meet those, those needs. <clears throat> and then they tell you that most states they're going to require you to, to do continuing ed because medicine changes. It changes all the time. And so we have to stay fresh. And the only way we can do that is through continuing ed. I sound like an old timer here um, when I say what I'm fixing to say. So, But don't ignore it <laughs> like I used to. But, um, you know, it wasn't long ago that... Um, you would get a license here and um, continuing ed was on you. Here at the cab, you know, we take care of that for you guys. We bring you up here, we give you these boring classes. Y'all cry, pitch fit, scream, holler, go back to the station, talk about how bad it was. But, you know, it wasn't long ago that, you know, I would go to work, work my shift, and go home and. I would have to find some way to get some continuing ed because, uh, you know, where I worked at the time, they didn't cover that. They they were like, we're too busy for that. You know, um, that's on your own. And you had to pay for it. And you had to pay for your license fee every, you know, every two years. I remember paying like, I paid a hundred bucks a year at the time. So yeah, I had to pay for that. I had to keep up with my hours. I had to make sure I had enough. And nobody to help me with that. But yeah, but nowadays, you know, it's better. And I'm glad it needs to be like that. All right, so yeah, in your in our job field, like um, you have to go through the PAT, right? Remember that? And so, yeah, so if you didn't pass the PAT, you didn't get a job. Well, there's people in, you know, I don't mean, we have our fire EMS and then you have private EMS out there, right? I think even AMR has some type of physical requirements. You know, you have to do some stuff to show that you can handle it. Um, but you need this law to protect people who could do all of that, but they have some type of disability. And you don't want, you know, somebody who could do the job as a minor disability to be looked over. That's why we have the Americans, Americans with Disability Act. History of EMS, like I said, Read about that. No problems there. Levels of training. That's what I've been talking about. Um, federal. Right? Federal government. The um, NHTSA. State level. Georgia Office of EMS. Local level. Medical director. Right? And it says state level. They have the laws that regulate EMS providers. Well, if there's laws... And there has to be legislation, legislation, right? And there is. Pull it up. It's coming up. There it is. Let me blow it up a little bit. Uh, 
uh, as as high as it's gonna get. But I put this up here just to kind of show you. I'm not gonna test you on any of these names. But Debbie Dingle is the chair of the EMS caucus in the House of Representatives and co-chaired by <coughs> Richard Hudson. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at all these members. They're making laws and decisions about EMS. These folks right here. And they may have no kind of history in EMS care. Um, and, you know, so you need to know that. You need to know as an advanced provider that there's a governed body, governing body, that makes laws. You know, and what what ends up happening is like you got the these uh, associations, like you have the uh, National EMS Educators Association. You have the you know National EMS um, whatever National Registry VM, uh, VMTs, and what they do is they lobby these guys, and they're like, hey. We need a law that say it, that that states that in 2025, in order to become a paramedic, there needs to be that needs to be a bachelor's degree, which no joke they're talking about doing. So they make laws about that, <clears throat> and this committee is kind of different in how it is established because, like the House Intel Committee. Uh, if I'm on that committee um, and I get reelected, I stay on usually stay on that committee. But this committee is like it's for whatever that term is, and then this all these folks get wiped out and replaced with new folks. I think it's kind of it makes you wonder. I don't know. It makes you wonder if this is just like you know. Uh, let's look here, like. Brian Babin. Hey, Brian. Um, sorry, man. Couldn't get you on the House Intel Committee. But, um, you know, we can get you over here to this EMS committee. You know, and that way you can at least say you're on a committee. So what do you think about that? You know, I don't know if that's the way it's done or not. But it would be better if they could make it the same folks over and over again. Because if I am if I'm Lisa Blunt Rochester... Rochester and I know nothing about EMS and you know maybe after you know a year or two I start kind of figuring it out boom I'm off that committee and just you know as soon as re-election time so I don't know it's just an opinion get rid of that all right so you kind of get in a picture now right EMS is much bigger than you know, much bigger than, well, like Engine 25. It's much bigger than Company 25. It's, this thing is, it's a monster. And so, that's the kind of stuff you need to know. And I'll tell you more about it in a minute, why you need to know it. All right, so, um, we have, you know, public initiatives like, you know, bystander CPR, stuff like that that sorry about that that we're involved in uh, that we should be involved in we have different like EMRs I mean, believe it or not I think uh, I don't I think like the Cat Police Department um, they're given like a first aid course they're not an EMR but they have some they have some training and so usually the EMR thing in other states is for that it could also be in other states for firefighters you know uh, smaller budgets they can't afford to send their folks to you know EMT school but we can we can get them EMR training so then you see these uh, about the EMT course um, the AEMT course paramedic course and talks about the hours these are pretty realistic, 150 hours, two to 400 hours. Now, in the state of Georgia, 
um, they have a thing where they're like, yeah, this is the approximate range we want the hours to be, but we are looking for competency uh, in this and not hours. So, you know, competency is what they're looking for. All right, components of the EMS system. We, we're talking about today, we're talking about how big EMS is and how it's just more than just, you know, the Cap County Fire Department. It's more than us. It's, it's very large in nature. And so you have this thing called EMS Agenda for the Future. So I want you to look at something. So this is from an EMS World uh, Magazine article here. And your book talks about it. Your book says, um, I think it says 14 core attributes that are talked about in the EMS agenda for the future. And it didn't lie, uh, but that's based on the 1996 um, original document called EMS agenda for the future. Now this document has been updated since then. Um, and there's some things that they're focusing on. And I just kind of like think you ought to know. And so what they're talking about and what they're wanting to see happen is for EMS to be inherently safe. All right, so. And up here. So we want EMS to be inherently safe and effective. All right. And the big word in this, I think, is called evidence based. Your book talks about it. This chapter talks about it. Evidence based. What does that mean? Well, what it means is like take spinal mobilization. Study after study after study is showing that spinal mobilization is hurting more people than it's helping. And it's, I've been saying it, it it's going to be taken out one day when we figure out evidence based and how to deal with it. Um, take um, sub Q epi. So we give 0.3 milligrams, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of sub Q epinephrine. The patients suffering an anaphylactic allergic reaction. But what if we gave this, and we know what it does. You know, we get that, we get uh, that bronchial vasodilation, and we get perif we get the peripheral uh, vasoconstriction. But what if we gave it all the time and it didn't work? And we're like, why do we keep doing this? Exactly. Why do we keep doing this? That's called evidence based. Now, in our case, that work it works every time. Thank God, right? Because we need it to work. Um, but yeah, and I'll give you another example. Uh, there's a drug called mag sulfate, magnesium sulfate, and I remember when it came out uh, for pre-hospital use. So people used to say, "Oh, that stuff, it's." It's not going to work. Studies show this, that, and, but it was early. And what they realized once they got more studies in that, oh yeah, it works. It works great. And I remember talking to our medical director about it. And, um, I was like, at the time I was like, Hey, you know, this study says it's not working. And then, you know, this one says it does. And, and he goes, well, we've used it before. Right. And I said, absolutely. He goes, does it work? And I said, yes, sir, it does. It works great. I was worried they were going to take it off. And he said, that's why we use it. That's why we'll continue to use it, because it works. And so not only do you have to have that evidence based, but common sense too, guys. You got to be able to say, yeah, this stuff works. I see, I've seen it work. All right. Integrated and seamless. All right. So integrated and seamless. Um, they're talking about... <clears throat> how we integrate EMS and where we integrate it at. Uh, so you have private based EMS like AMR, you have hospital based EMS like Grady, 
you have fire rescue EMS like us, okay, there's, in some parts of the country, there's PD-based EMS. I have a buddy of mine who used to work here who does that up north somewhere. Um, how, how are we integrating this and where we're integrating this, does it work? It needs to be seamless in how we, how we do it. Like EMTs, AEMTs, providing care, paramedic shows up, you know, taking over that care, you know, that needs to be a seamless deal, right? And we know that we're, we need some work there. Reliable. Right, and prepared. It needs to be reliable. What we do, it needs to be like that every single time. Somebody calls 911 every single time. And we need to be prepared. Staffing. We need to have units staffed and ready to roll when we need them. And socially equitable, right? Um, we need to be able to be, right, as trained as the responder is in Cobb County. If they're like, man, we have a lot of pediatric uh, advanced life support training up here, man, and I feel like that that's helped me so much, and I, I can handle all these pediatric patients, and I might be down here in cab going, man, I feel uncomfortable dealing with pediatrics. I just don't feel like I have enough training. And so we're talking about that. All right, sustained and effective. All right, <clears throat> it needs to be uh, sustained, Right, and meaning that um, funding, uh, it needs to be sustained. And wherever it's at, it needs to be funded so it can be sustained. And it needs to be efficient, right? It needs to be able to run the calls and do what it needs to do efficiently. <clears throat> Adaptable, right? And But innovative. So not only do we need to be able to adapt uh, to our to the changes in the area, but we need to be able to think forward and have some better ideas about how we handle you know ST elevated MIs. You know why are we doing EKGs in the field, calling a STEMI alert, and then going to the hospital and what's the first thing they do? Do an EKG. Why? You already have one that shows there's ST elevation. You know that sort of thing. So all of that is what they're focusing on right now. Along with the degree program for paramedics, you know, and making the class that we're teaching now, um, making that accredited and um, that changes everything because, you know, you get college credit for what you're doing now. So yeah, that's where we're at. Get rid of this. Okay. So that is what, you know, they're doing at the national level. Now, remember, when we talk about EMS history, we talk about the white paper in the 1960s, right? <clears throat> people dying in car crashes left and right. It was killing more people than, than anything at the time was car accidents. They didn't have a way to transport people to the hospital. They didn't have a way to cut people out of cars. It was, uh, you know, a terrible time in history, but they had to re they had to issue a way to pay for that, and they didn't do that till 1974. So yeah, the idea was there in the 60s, and it sounded good, but guys, that thing didn't get off the ground in the 70s, and even then, 1974, we it started up kind of heavy then, but I bet in Georgia, we didn't start. We didn't start uh, pumping out paramedics and things like that probably till the 80s. So, quite interesting. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, when we, at a national level and a state level, we recognize that something needs to be changed, that we can do it a little more, a little more quickly. So yeah, 1999, that was what I was showing you earlier. All right, you still got to know about that enhanced 911. All right, those definitions, because you're going to see it again. 
You're going to see it again. Also, since we're talking about test, um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they're going to regulate the standards under which AEMTs provide emergency care. Write that down. Now, I'm not going to repeat it because you can rewind it. You know when somebody asked that. Hey, can you repeat that? Rewind it. Ah, that's a bad term too. Because it's not on tape, right? You can you can back you can back it up, maybe that's a better word. Um let's see here. So yeah, this is just blah blah. All right, so here's your medical director. So, your medical director at the local level. So you have you have like I said the federal. Let's let me pull something up real quick. Let me pull something up real quick. So, this. Is going to be your national, your federal, right? This is the federal national EMS scope of practice. And we're going to look at the state scope of practice in a second. So all of this shit right here, guys, is what they, what the federal government recommends that an advanced EMT can start a peripheral IV, okay, or a pediatric uh, IO. And so the state, the state said, yeah, yeah, well, we agree with that. That's a great idea. Okay, so then, that's, remember, this is called scope of practice. And so, if I can get it to pull up here. Bam. There's a state scope of practice. This is David Newton. He is the... Oh, director of the office of EMS. He's a good guy. We worked together years ago, back in the day when we were jaking it up. And so you need to review this. I mean, not, it's not going to be, well, I, I don't, don't think I'm going to test, tested you specifically, but you need to know. Well, I mean, there's going to be some questions. I, honestly, there, there'll be questions like, you know, what can you do? What can an EMT do? So, as far as scope of practice, you should know what you can do as an EMT. But yeah, so, but I will tell you this. Everybody, everybody, everybody can do hemorrhage control. EMR to paramedic. So, that's something to remember. But yeah, so, this is the state. They said, yeah, you're right. And we are going to let our EMTs do that. And so. When you come down here to the pharmacological stuff. Peripheral IV insertion, right? So you see the E is not here. Right here is the E. But an intermediate, which is an old school advance uh, but actually you'll be actually more advanced than an I but an A right here that's you can do this this includes you know INT sailing lock you can <clears throat> start that you can do IOs right here so yeah they agreed with the federal government on that so back to the medical director <clears throat> how do they fall in this what say so do they have having say so they do have some say so so what they can do is they could say look uh, the national standards along with the state office of EMS has adopted the scope of practice that says paramedics can do endotracheal intubation and you know providing you know intubation we're taking an endotracheal tube and we're passing it through the vocal cords. It's an advanced airway device uh, for people in respiratory failure or respiratory arrest. The medical director can say, we're not doing that. 
okay, for whatever reason, they could say, you know, uh, you know we, we're not good at it, whatever, I don't know. They could say no, and we would have to abide by that. Now, the medical director can't say that, you know, I had a conversation with Mike Morris at the Campfire Rescue. He's completely amazing, probably one of the smartest people I've ever talked to, <clears throat> and, and he should say all of that. <laughs> but no, seriously, he could say, but, uh, you know, he was talking about that we should be hanging whole blood in the field. And by the way, we should be doing that. Um, but he he could not authorize that. All right, because that he can't take the scope of practice forward. He can reduce it, but he can't take it forward. Does that make sense? I need to have a roster in front of me so I can call you guys out. I'll do that next time, just to mess with you guys. All right, so if you need to stretch, pause it. All right, I know, I know it's kind of boring, right? But this stuff is important. It's important because this is your career set. This is what you've sold your soul for. Okay? And, you know, so it is for today. And I hope it, you know, you like it enough to this is your career. But these are the people who make decisions, and you need to know that. You need to know how they do. I don't know how they do it, but you need to know who does it. And what they what they can do and what they can't do. All right. Remember online and offline? But yeah. You need to keep up. Yeah, you need to remember all that because you could be tested on that. But you should know that. You should get that. Okay. Let's keep, I'm just, I'm going through. If you, if we covered this heavy in EMT school, guys, I'm not doing it. Because I'm not going to bore you to death, number one. Now, if you need questions, call me. Call me. Because I'll be glad to go over it with you. But I'm not going to bore you guys to death on stuff you already know. And, you know, I'm not going to insult you either by covering stuff that we covered in EMT school. The mobile and integrated health care, right? It came from, you know, feds, uh, federal government and all that stuff in 1999. So the medical director maintains quality control. Why? Well, you know, they're not maintaining. I mean, they're advised on it. A, a medical director worth a, a grain of salt is going to want to know, hey, out of the last 15 cardiac arrests, how many of those patients got intubated correctly? And our CQI department needs to be able to answer that because <clears throat> let's, yeah, this is going to raise up another good subject too. I'll, but, you know, like the medical director is responsible for knowing that because they need to, they need to make changes. And if we're not doing well in that area now, as a paramedic, let's say I go out and I, and I, I don't intubate the last seven people. I've put the ET tube in their esophagus, right? Um, and let's say one of those was a catastrophic incident and, you know, probably litigation's coming about it. Well, that medical director cannot lose their license based on that. That's why we have a license. That's why they came up with all of this. Because who would be a medical director of a emergency department of a fire department fire ems department an ambulance service if somebody can make a mistake like that and they could lose their license i hear it all i hear it every now and then you know hey we work under that medical director's license no we don't no we don't we do not we work under our license that they can suspend or they could terminate they could say, Mike, no, I'm not going to use myself as an example for this because I know I'm too good. <laughs> Just kidding, though. No, I'll use me as an example. Uh, they could say, Mike, you know, um, you, th this was, you know, unbecoming of a paramedic. And, you know, 
your license. We're suspending them and you're done. Okay, but the medical director is not going to lose their license. But now where the medical director could, could share some of this blame is if they're not asking these questions about CQI and quality improvement. If they're not asking, hey, out of the last cardiac arrest, how many of these patients got X, Y, and Z? You know, these are things that, that they need to be doing. Now, they could share some of that if they're not doing that. That's why we have continuing ed and refresher training. <clears throat> yeah, funding. Uh, you know, we're tax based in uh, tax based funding here. Um, educational systems co amps that is the accreditation agency. Now, every paramedic school taught in the state of Georgia has to be accredited through co amps <clears throat> or they can't teach. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's coming for AEMT as well, probably in 2025. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Continuing ed, we talked about that. All right, all right, specialty centers. The state office of EMS is over trauma centers, burn centers, all of these. All right, so it's the state that regulates that. So if you had somebody who needs to go to a specialty center, and thermal burns would be somebody who would need a specialty center. Just saying. Just saying. Might want to remember that. Um, the state office of EMS is over that. Not the federal government. That's the state. That's a state deal. The state is responsible for how we carry out our treatment and protocols. Okay, that's a state thing. Okay, and then there's some roles and responsibilities of the AEMT. Integrity. Hope y'all, I think everybody here is pretty, understands that pretty well. All right, guys, that's it. Um, we're going to go into chapter two uh, pretty soon. I'm going to try to break it out per chapter. So uh, until we meet again, guys, have a great day.